Thank you and welcome everybody. Look at this uh, ballpark. It's been around the block a few times from the Green Monster over to Pesky's Pole to that little red seat way out there in right field, 502 feet away, the longest home run ever hit at Fenway Park. Great people have played here. Carl Yostremsky, Bobby Dewar, Joe Cronin, Babe Ruth, as we heard, have all been on this field here. But what was it that made the, made the vision of Ted Williams special? How was he able to hit that 502 foot home run? Well, my name is Dr. Daniel Abbey. I'm an ophthalmologist. I'm a sports vision specialist. I've been working in sports vision for the past 27 years. I want to share with you this afternoon some of what I've learned and some of what we've been able to use to help ball players perform on this field as well as others uh, at a higher level. To do that, we have to think about what's the underlying main point for a baseball player, and that's the word prediction. A baseball player has to predict, a batter especially, has to predict where the ball is going to be any moment in time. If he can predict that accurately, he's going to be able to hit the ball, make contact with it, and the ball's not that big. We're talking about a three-inch ball, a two-and-a-quarter-inch bat. You've got to make contact with that to drive that ball 502 feet like Ted Williams did. What was there about his vision that let him predict exactly when the ball was going to cross the plate and when he was going to put the bat on the ball to drive it? And that's really what comes down to the vision, the need for vision in baseball. How long does it take for a baseball pitch 90 miles an hour to reach home plate? It takes 400 milliseconds. That's less than half a second. Well, you don't have 400 milliseconds to hit it or to see it because it takes about 150 milliseconds to actually swing the bat from your shoulder back around to, to the front where the ball is. 400 minus 150 leaves a quarter of a second, 250 milliseconds. Well, you know, we can't just think and the bat moves. We have to think about it, decide to swing. We have to send a neural signal down through the nerves, the muscles to get them to contract to make that bat move. Well, that takes time, too. That's about 100, 150 milliseconds to do that. So when you do the math, you're left only with about 100 to 150 milliseconds of seeing this ball from maybe 50 feet away, 60 feet away, to know what the spin is, to decide what pitch it is, to start that decision process to swing. That's not very easy. You know how long it takes to blink? It takes 300 milliseconds to blink. That's twice as long as you have to look at the ball before you have a chance to decide to swing or not. This is a tough thing to do. Hitting a baseball has been termed one of the most difficult things to do in, in all of baseball, and all of sports in general, right? Well, we're interested in sports vision, how that happens. How is it that a, a batter can actually make that visual information relevant and swing and hit the ball? We're interested in not only what the eyes are doing, we're interested in all the way the process of that information through the eyes, through the brain, to the vision part of the brain, which is back here, then how that visual information moves forward to the decision areas, to the motor areas, to connect with an action that's going to be successful, as we saw with Ted Williams. That's what sports vision is about. And it's not just relevant to baseball. It's relevant to any sport. Think about a basketball player, a soccer player, a football player, a quarterback. Tom Brady's got to look at the whole field. He's got to react. He's got to see. He's got to make decisions. He's got to move. This isn't just trivial. This is based on ability and skill and talent. Hopefully a little bit of magic from us for sports vision specialists. One great example of that is when we look at a picture here of a player that graced this field, Manny Ramirez, back several years ago. And what I want you to look at on this picture is where the ball is and where his bat is and where his eyes are. You see, the ball is about to hit the bat, but his eyes are far off in the distance. His eyes are looking to that last piece of point of information after 100 milliseconds of the ball being thrown that he can still get information. At that point, it doesn't matter anymore after that because he can't react to that, can't think about it, can't make a muscle movement fast enough to make any difference in where the bat's going to be placed. So he knows, and he's probably one of the best hitters that's ever sat in this field. And I said sat on purpose. He's one of the, one of the people that knows that by looking at the distance, that's all the information you need. In fact, he could have closed his eyes. And he, could you imagine if Manny has closed his eyes when he was swinging, what people would have said. You would have heard Manny being Manny all day. He would have been ridiculed. But the truth is, he didn't need to have his eyes open because there's no more information. But the real fact is, he couldn't even have time to close his eyes because it takes 300 milliseconds to blink. So he had no chance to do that. So who knows, maybe he did close his eyes. But Manny Ramirez, his vision is critical. Ted Williams' vision was critical. In fact, in, 20, in 1996, we published a paper about the basic visual abilities of baseball players. And we demonstrated, we showed through hundreds of players that we did in Major League Baseball, that the average vision is 20 over 12. Now, normal vision is called 20 over 8. The best vision humanly possible is 20, I'm sorry, normal vision is 20 20. The best vision possible is 20 over 8. Well, 20 over 12 means that these ball players can see from 20 feet what us average people had to be 12 feet away from to see. So they can see things farther away. 
And that's one of the keys, one of the differences in vision of these athletes' ability to hit the ball. Now we measured that vision using a chart just like this. You've probably seen this in a doctor's office. This is called a Snellen chart. And this chart's been around for quite a while. We'll talk about that in a minute. But it starts with a big E and works its way down. And remember that each of these letters is black on white. And you have as long as you need to look at it to try to figure out what the answer is. You probably sat in the office and said, well, I think it might be an F. No, maybe it's an E, an O, or a Q, who knows what. And you go back and forth until you finally get it right. The doctor says, great. And you got 20-20 vision, and you're out the door. Well, that doesn't work over here at Fenway Park. It doesn't work at any major league ballpark, because this isn't what vision is like. This is a chart that was actually developed, invented in 1862. That's 150 years ago. There was no electricity. There were no telephones. And this test was black on white. You can look at it for as long as you wanted to and give an answer. Well, that's not what goes on in the field. On the field, what goes on is you have a split second, as we mentioned, to see something. You've got to react quickly. It's small. It's not black on white. It's red on, red on white. It may be a little bit dusty. There may be fingers that aren't necessarily black on white or, or white on white. Contrast is an issue. It's much harder than this selling chart. In truth, this selling chart is not very useful. It's not useful for baseball. It's not useful for driving. And the truth is, this is what we should do with the selling chart. It's not necessary. It's not the way to test people's vision on everyday lives, whether that has to do with hitting a baseball, whether it has to do with driving a car. How many of you have driven on a foggy day near dusk where the lighting's not so good in a place you don't know where you have to try to read the sign? Look at all those hands go up. Where you have to read the sign, and you have a split second to do it because you're driving and you have to decide what to do, and it's not easy. It's not like a doctor's office where you have forever to look at the chart. So we recognize that in driving, in sports, in life, that's not the best way to test vision. So we developed a test that's based on technology currently. It's based on iPads. It's based on the computing ability of these devices to present targets that are very different than that. Our targets that we present are circles that have some bars around them, and they're open on the bottom. So the only difference in one circle to the next is where the opening is. Is it the bottom open? Is the top open? Left open or right open? And this is a big one. This is easy. This is for us folks. What we give the ball players is one that's much smaller. It's much grayer. It's gray on white. It's not black on white like this. And we only show it for, we only show it for 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds, a very short time. And by using math based on the SATs and the ACT, ACTs, we can calculate the score. And that score is what we use to decide whether a baseball player has the vision they need to hit this baseball. Let me give you an example of that. I'm going to talk to you about two players, and all this information has been in the public domain already, so you're not hearing any big secrets, but hopefully you're putting it in context that makes it more interesting. 2013, World Series, if you remember that, against the Cardinals. Team was away. They came back uh, one afternoon, and I got a phone call. The phone call was from the, the head trainer. There's a player who was playing for the postseason. He was batting four for 40. That's not so hot. That's about a 100 batting average. In the World Series, he's batting one for 15. That's even worse. He was great in the field. So they wanted, they wanted him on the field. They didn't want to take him off the field, but they wanted not to have an out. They wanted to score. Uh, his name was Stephen Drew. And Stephen Drew came to my office. Um, we took a look at him. We gave him that test there. And we found that he needed contact lenses. We gave him contact lenses. That next day, we gave him a supply of contact lenses. The next day, he came to, to the dugout over here. And actually, between, he didn't want to play in the field with them because he wasn't sure how that was going to be, but he wanted to bat with them. So we ran off into the, into the dugout, into the little tunnel there. Um, they put the contact lenses on his eyes. He came back on the field. And that game, where he had been 4 for 40 and 1 for 15, that game he went 2 for 4. One was a home run that basically sealed the 2013 series for the Red Sox, if you remember. And he would have been 3 for 4, but the first base from the Cardinals made an amazing catch and took away uh, that third hit. But 2 for 4, 500 is a whole lot better than 1 for 15. So that made a difference for Steven. Uh, he talked about it in the press uh, after that. but the. Testing him on a test that's critical, that's not easy like that selling chart that we disposed of, on a test that shows a difference, that shows a deficiency, and then intervening is what sports vision is all about. Let me give you another example. And this one's a fun example because it's not just about how sharp your vision is. It's a matter of what you do with that information. You don't have to just see it. You have to be able to react to it. You have to have the hand-eye coordination to, make, to move the bat in the right place at the right time. I got a call in, um, I guess it was probably May or June 2014, about another player. You've already seen a picture of him over here, Manny Ramirez. I got a call from Jim Rowe, who at that point was the head trainer for the Red Sox, and said, you know, Manny's not seeing the ball. And I said, I'm sure Jim, he's seen the ball. I just saw him a month ago, six weeks ago in Fort Myers. He's seeing the ball really good. No, no, Dan, you don't understand. He's not see seeing the ball. Okay, what are you talking about? Ends up being that the problem was he wasn't reacting to it. He didn't feel comfortable. 
And this is Manny. Manny had great hands. Manny was, was a wonderful batter. Uh, he could use a shower once in a while when he hugged me when he was sweaty, but he was, he was a great guy. Um, and he just wasn't feeling comfortable. So the, Jim said, you got to do something here because we need this guy to perform. So what we did was try to figure out how can we help Manny. Well, how can I, he was seeing fine, but he wasn't reacting. His hand-eye coordination wasn't good. So I knew about these rings. These, this is a ring that had been out in the, in, in, uh, available commercially prior to it. Uh, but I thought about this, this task. And this task is the wiffle ball on the ring, and we throw this ball, this ring, and the ball rotates, and you have to catch the ball. Now, any of you who think this is easy, I can guarantee you it's really hard. But they say, you know, Manny is Manny. Manny is pretty good. So one ball is probably not going to be good enough. So let me make another ring where we had four balls. So we had four wiffle balls, four different colors. I threw that, and I'll tell you what happened on that in a minute. But then I say, you know, Manny's still Manny. He's pretty good. I better have another ring. So then we invented actually a new ring, and that's this ring. And this ring is a little different, as you can tell. This ring has four baseballs on it that are painted kind of strange. Well, this painting is specific, because these, these patterns of paint represent different pitches. When the baseball is thrown at 90 miles an hour, there's spin. The spin and the effect of the seams on the surface of the ball is what creates air currents, basically like a wing of an airplane, to make the ball move in different directions. And depending on how you throw that spin, it moves one way, or you throw a spin a different way, it goes a different way. And those, spin, those seams look different depending on how they're thrown. So each of these different stripes, these different red dots on here, represent a different pitch. So now what I, I figured I would do is I go to Manny and I say, I'll throw you this, and I'm going to call out the word fastball when the thing is halfway to you, and you've got to identify which one's a fastball, and you've got to catch it. So now we've got to do is identify the pitch, make a motor movement to intercept the pitch, just like he does with his bat to hit the ball. Well, I went to Fenway Park over here, went down to the clubhouse in, uh, in, 20, uh, in 2014. And remember, 2013 was, was a tough season, right? They lost in, in New York um, at the, at the, end, of the end of the series against the Yankees. And it was pretty, uh, it was pretty charged in 2014 that we got to do better. There's a new manager in town. We got to do better. So I went down there with these, my three rings, and we, a couple of guys were down in the clubhouse, a couple other players, a couple old timers, threw them this first ring over here. No one could catch it at all. No one caught, not even the easy one. So then uh, Manny comes over. Manny used to like to play hide and seek in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the clubhouse, and I had to try to find him. But we finally found him. He came over, and I threw this to him. And he, every single time, first time, he caught it, the single ball, nailed it every time. He said, Doc, this is too easy. This is not what I want to do. I said, OK, Manny, luckily I got choice number two. I pulled out the ring with the four balls, threw that to him. Doc, too easy. Got it every time. What else you got, Doc? Very short on the patience part. Um, <laughs> So I brought up my ring over here, and I threw this ring, and this actually was challenging because I called out the pitch, I called out the ball halfway to him, and he had to make that, that catch to catch it. And he did this every game, prior to every game, for the rest of the season, the rest of his career. He taught it to some other players. Uh, if you read Terry Francona's book about that season, he'll, there's a section that talks about the rings in there as well. And this seemed to help Manny kind of fine-tune his hand-eye coordination. He had great vision, but fine-tune the hand-eye coordination in order to hit the ball well. Ended up being, if you remember, the MVP of the World Series that year in 2014. And Manny was Manny, and uh, he's, a great, um, he's, a, he's a great guy. I think he's misunderstood, but he's a great guy. So that, that's kind of, there you have it. You know, we have, a, we have these, these skills, not just vision, not just hand-eye coordination, but just reaction time. There's, there's anticipation ability. There's a whole series of concentration tests that we perform on these, on these players here to try to make sure they have what they need in terms of their visual function, their visual motor function to perform on the field and hit those home runs at 502 feet. Remember, seven out of 10 times, if you make a mistake, you're an all-star, right? That's pretty good. Well, there's one person that may have, may have been able to benefit from what we do. Uh, if you think back on the classic American poem, Casey at the Bat, uh, and you know, potentially if Casey had spent some time with a sports business specialist, there may not have been any, any there may have been actually joy in Mudville that day, and Casey may not have struck out. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>